64, right? So we'll be singing Standing on the Promises a cappella style. It's him 364, Standing on the Promises. All right. Him 364, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. All right, you may be seated. Good morning. I had prepared the lesson for English and Spanish, but since most of the people here can understand English, I'm going to go stay with English. I thought this was going to be the first day when I would teach both, um, but that'll have to be another time, I guess. And so... Let's pray. Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, help us to look into your wondrous word and to understand it. We ask this through your son's name, Jesus Christ, for beside you there is another God. Amen. The Bible is the word of God, and all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness. Righteousness or right living. Now, I want to take you back to Luke eleven thirteen because uh, chapter 11 starts with the disciples asking the Lord, it's, teach us how to pray. And, and then he answered this, Luke eleven thirteen. if then, if you then be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more your heavenly, shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So this is what he's, uh, he says. If, you, if, if, the, if your children ask you for this thing, bread, fish, or 
eggs, he says, you're not going to give them a rock or a serpent or a scorpion. He says, you're not going to do that. You being evil know how to give good gifts. You'll give the right thing. And then he says this, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So the thing is here, ask him. And we covered that. We covered how we are supposed to. But that seems kind of strange. Because in the Old Testament, when you become a Christian, you automatically get the Spirit of God. Bam. The minute you believe, you get the Spirit of God. But in the Old Testament, they never got the Spirit of God in sight. The Spirit of God always came, hovered above them, on them. But in the New Testament, it's inside them. So see the difference? So here, the, when, he asking, when, he's asking the, when he's telling the disciples, ask for the Holy Spirit, this was prophetic. This was to come in the future because they will not get this, the Spirit of God until Pentecost. 50 days after the resurrection. But for us Christians, we already have the Spirit of God. So why would we be asking for the Spirit of God? And so there's something here that God is teaching us that we need to be filled with the Spirit of God all the time. But I'm going to show you something else here as well. So this happens to be it was going to be a difficult lesson anyways, and to, for me to teach it at the same time in English and Spanish, it was going to be a double whammy. I said, good night, Lord. So yesterday was not, when I talked with Brother Ashton, he says, oh, the Hispanic people will probably be there as well. I says, wow, it's already difficult as it is in English. So, but nonetheless, so look at this. In Proverbs twenty twenty seven. before we get into the theme of this study, in Proverbs 20, 27, says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Now, this is good. This is very, it's, it's needful. We need to understand this. Look what it says here, the belly. What is the belly? The belly is the body. That's what it is, el cuerpo. That's what that is. And he says, the spirit of man is the candle. The candle. And so, because we've been dealing with light. Remember the past, past few studies, we've, we've been dealing with light. And remember I said, if your eye is not working right, your eye is not picking up light correctly. And you could have a faulty eye. So, the spirit of man is the candle. It's not the light. We, we automatically think the candle is the light, but it's not the light. The candle is not the light. The candle is the lamp. The, the lamp is the one that gives off light. You know, you can see. Or it, it's an instrument. That's what that is. The lamp is an instrument. So what is the light? I'm glad you asked. The light is the spirit of God. So here you have these three things. According to Proverbs 20, 27, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. The Lord, the Lord uses that candle to illuminate. Now here's what happens. When the eye is evil, and the Bible, we just saw that last study. When the eye is evil, that means you need glasses. Because everything looks, seems double or triple or quadruple. You know, and these, I see, you see many. And you, it needs to be focused. When the eye is evil, it d distorts things. You don't see clearly. And so what's going to happen, that's what they had just done. Remember when he cast out the demons and they said, they wondered, how does he do that? by Beelzebub, and they wanted signs. So this is the thing. It wasn't clear. And they were 
not, the Lord says, this is an evil generation. Now, so they were not able to distinguish or correctly identify the Spirit of God. Because Jesus was there. Jesus was there, and he cast out demons, and they said, no, you're casting them, by, casting them out by Beelzebub. And others said, we want a sign. So this is what I needed to start here before I gave you the thesis. Now, when the single eye, when it's a single eye, that means it's focused <laughs> properly. Focuses properly. That means when you correctly understand, that means then the light comes into your body and the body will be full of light. That's what that means. It'll be full of light. And so that's what he's teaching us here. He wants us to be full of light. He, want, he wants the Spirit. When the Spirit of God comes in us, if we correctly identify him, if we correctly understand, when the Spirit of God woos us, we're full of light. And that's needful. Because that's why I have the background of the world there. Because the world needs light. This is a dark world. And it needs light. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But, God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. There it is. That's the only way you get insight, by the spirit of God. For the spirit of God searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So this is the thesis. All that just to prepare you for the thesis. The thesis is found in Luke 11:35. So we jump way, we go from verse 11 to all to 35. And he says this, Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. So if the light comes inside us, make sure that that light is correctly, and that's what happens with a lot of people, they don't understand that correctly. They get religion, and they think that religion that they have is salvation, and it's not. And this is what he's going to be teaching us here. He says, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Because God wants the light that's in us, if it's the correct light, he wants the light to come in us and to go out to the world. That's what he wants, because that's what he gave Israel. Israel had the Bible. He gave them the Bible. That's the word of God to give to the whole world. That's where Israel was placed in that uh, land bridge that connects all those three huge land masses. They were there for that purpose. They were there to teach the world. And that's why we, I teach the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. They're two separate things. The kingdom of heaven is not the same thing as the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven belongs to the Jew or man. God gave the kingdom of heaven to man. Remember, the kingdom of God was here when God made the world and Adam. But Adam sinned and the connection was lost. So God reestablishes the land again through Noah and then finally through Abraham. Abraham got it by an unconditional covenant. You get a, and there it is, folks. It's a real piece of land. You can go to Israel. It's there. It's a real piece of land, and it's called the Holy Land because that land belongs to God, and God gave it to the Jew. And so, but they had the light. But notice what happened, folks. They rejected the king. They lost the light. And now you go to Israel, they're just like a regular nation, a heathen nation. What happened? Well, that light, folks, we now have that light. We're not Israel, because God is, we don't take, I mean, yes and no. We're here doing what Israel couldn't do, but we're not doing a great job either. 
the church is getting worldly. And it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker as days go by. So God tells us, look, see what happened to Israel? It can happen to you. And that's what the, this is why you have the two kingdoms. Because if the whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, and this is what he's going to teach us, in, uh, what we're going to be looking at this, in this lesson. He doesn't want any of this darkness that Israel had in us. Because if you have that darkness in you, the people will not be able to see. And God wants us, the truth, God wants us to see, God wants the whole world to see him and be saved. Come unto me. The, if the whole body, he wants the whole body, all of it. To be full of light. Having no part dark. And that's divided. You can't be divided like they were. Divided. Would they wonder? It was Beelzebub. We want signs. It was all messed up. And so God says, I don't want any part. Any, any of that darkness in you. The, that means... Uh, it's got that comma there, no part dark, and it's got a comma. I believe you could, you, could, you could say, then the whole shall be full of light. If there's no part, no part darkness in you, the whole, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. So when you light up a candle and it lights up the room, that's what a candle should do. That's what a flashlight should do. Or the switch, when you turn the switch on, boom, you have light. Dissipates the darkness. So it says, then, if you're full of light, you'll be a light bulb. You, boom, you're going to give light. You're going to give off light. That's what you're going to be. You're going to be a lamp. And that's what God wants. So he's preparing us for what he's, gonna, he's about to t teach us. Okay? He's about to get into the lesson, but we need to understand this. That's verse 36, which is, if the whole body, therefore, be full of light. Then 37, and as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. See, it looks like he just changed topics. He's right on topic still because he's showing us the darkness that seeped in through Israel. This is a darkness which God does not want in his church. What's that darkness? Well, look what it said. A Pharisee. What's a Pharisee? A, a Pharisees were, they're religious. But at the beginning, they, were, they started good. When they started at, at the Maccabees, in the era of the Maccabees, right before uh, three, four, five hundred years before Christ, the, the Maccabees, that's when Israel was uh, fighting against the Greeks. Uh, and that's when they have that battle up in Masada. So they started right because they were shepherdess. They wanted to keep the Jews pure. That's what they wanted to do. They were good. But slowly this darkness crept thin. And look, now, when the Pharisees saw it, he marveled. He was surprised. They said, whoa, what is this? Why? Because he didn't wash his hands. And they equated not washing your hands as being morally impure. Ah, no se lavó las manos. That's what they were, they were looking at that. This is, he didn't wash his hands, so he's morally impure. But this thing, it's not just regular wash, just a regular washing of hands. This is something special. Because that word here, wash, is baptizo. That means... It's a ceremonial ablution. That's what it is. It's ceremonial. They had a real, you know, have you ever seen how doctors wash their hands? 
I mean, they really scrubbed their hands really good, and they, they you know, and, and then the nurse comes along and gives them the towel, and, and it's done because they don't want anything to contaminate whatever he's going to be touching. Uh, we don't do that to, to eat hot dogs. I mean, people sometimes don't even wash to eat hot dogs. I mean, when you're out camping, I mean, all these years that I've done camps with children, I take them hiking and I'm handling all, touching all kinds of things, and then we come into the class um, or to, to, to the meal, and I just eat. And sometimes I wash and sometimes I don't, you know. Uh, and being around my dad, like I said before, he was a truck driver, and I saw him a lot of times. He says, you hungry? I says, yeah, Dad. He says, I know a place where we can have right there by Lubbock, and he says, we can get good barbecue sandwiches. And I would stop, and we would stop at this little house, and we would have barbecue sandwiches. And we just sat down, and the, the, the man just brought us the sandwiches and a big, tall Fanta orange. Man, what a meal. We never washed our hands. How many times we did that? I don't know. It's not a practice. I mean, we should wash our hands, right? I mean, every mother does that. But in this case, it's something else, folks. That's what it's, this is. It's showing us that they were so picky, and they said, he's morally impure. And they're talking about Jesus. And the Lord said unto him, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter. He says, you guys are so finicky. You make the outside. You want to make sure that it's clean really good on the outside. They had made it a ceremony. But your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Wow. And that word, wickedness, poneria, depravity. That's immoral, moral corruption. That, they were trying to get him, in, uh, they, would, they were trying to say that about him, and he turns it around and says, you guys are clean on the outside, but the inside is wicked. You fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? So see, this is what the Lord is telling us here. Be careful you don't get like this because that's what, they ha that's what happened to them. And folks, if you go to Israel, it's sad. The first time I went, I walked around in the days like, this is not a holy place. No, it's not. Israel is not a holy place. Jeremiah said this about them. This is the holy people. He says, they were as fed horses in the morning, everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I, shall I not visit for these things, says the Lord, and shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? He had had that problem with them throughout, and so it didn't ha hadn't changed. And look what it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. This is what he's saying. And that is the darkness that has crept into Israel. They got religious. And folks, we can get like that too. This is why he's warning us, especially when you start reading the Bible and you understand it, after a certain period of time, you start thinking that I'm pretty good. You know, I'm better than people that don't know the Bible. God says, don't do that. Don't do that. Because it's creeping in, and before you know it, you'll start looking down at people. You look down at them, and you should never do that. Because you don't know the inside. People could be very sincere in looking for for God, and here you are judging them on their unshined shoes. And says, and this is why he's warning, that's a darkness that can creep in. But rather, give alms of such things as you have, and behold, all things are clean.
clean unto you. This is a difficult verse. This is a difficult study, folks. But look what he says here. But rather give alms. Give alms of such things as you have. And to give alms or limosna is to be compassionate. When you give money to the poor, that's because you're compassionate. You see somebody by the bus stop and you want to help them out. So you're compassionate. So you give of such, of such things as you have. But here, folks, when they were claiming to be holier than thou and washing themselves, making sure that everybody saw how they were clean, but on the outside, God says, what about the inside? So he says, as such things as you have. Well, what do you have? You know what, folks? I'm just like anybody else. I'm a teacher of the Word of God. But the inside, i got to constantly monitor that because i got to constantly watch my thoughts because they go off, constantly going off. You're const- it's a struggle. And years ago, I remember me, we said with Jake and uh, uh, Isaiah and some of the young guys, I sat with them over at a, at a place we ate some hamburgers, and I was telling them the struggles that I have. And they were looking at me like, you have struggles? I says, yeah, yeah. And that's what God wants because I'm no better than anybody else. The insight, I'm not better than anybody else. Behold, all things are clean unto you. When you have compassion and look at others as, as you would yourself. I mean, I'm not any cleaner than anybody else. I'm still having the same things that everybody else has. It says, then it'll be clear, and you won't put yourself above others. See? In fact, the more, the closer you get to the Lord, the more you realize how unclean you are. That's really how it is. Because look at, look at this, and I, I, I thought I'd give you a little, uh, a, a couple of verses here. Look at Luke 18, 13. And the publican standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This man that was there at the temple, remember the other man? The other man says, I'm not like him. I do all this. You know, I do for this for God. I do this for God. And here you have a publican saying, Lord, he didn't even want to lift, raise his eyes to, towards God. He says, I'm a sinner, Lord. I am a sinner. Please be merciful unto me. And look what the Lord says. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Because God looks. He says, I look at the inside. And says, this man, he wants mercy. But the Jews, on the other hand, they had special, in, in, even the instruments in which to draw water <coughs> to wash their hands were special, special instruments. But woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs. They had the special eyes. They had become so religious because <coughs> they wanted to show off. Woe unto you, great sorrow or distress for you guys because you think you have it. And, and you know, a lot of people, the Lord is going to say, I never knew you. You had religion. <coughs> Excuse me. They tithe of the little things. You know, I've got to make sure I do this. got to make sure I do that. Make all the details. And, so, and I tell you what, folks, it can, we can get like that. We can start thinking that we, we have it right because the way we do things. But that's necessar- not necessarily the way it is. Because <coughs> we have a, 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 a decor or, or, or uh, the way we do life. I mean, I like the way we do it here at, at, at Research. But there's other churches that are doing differently. And, I mean, God's okay with them. And he's okay with us. They're different. I mean, if, if you ever attend a, a black church uh, like 
Antioch Church in Houston, wow, it's a good experience. You know, I mean, feels like they get into it, you know? I mean, they get into it. And you, you can say, wow, but that's not me. I mean, I tend towards Presbyterian, you know? I tend into more solemnness. I like quietness. But actually, I'm in the middle of the road. You know, I like both, you know? And if people want to raise their hands, it's okay. I normally don't raise my hands in the, in the, with a bunch of people. I normally raise my hands when I'm in, the, I'm in a country by myself. I says, Lord, you are so fantastic. I don't want to do that. In, in this, in, in, you know, because that's just my temperament. Okay. So they would look at this. And pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. This is what the Lord is saying. You're majoring on the trivial. And we can do that when we start looking at people's dress. I mean, people, especially women, need to be modest. That's it. And so do men. But other than that, hey, if that's what you got to come to church with, that's fine. I'm glad you're here. You know? Leave it alone. Because that's counting the seats. And that can creep into the church. And God says, that is darkness. That can creep into the church. Woe unto you Pharisees, for you love the upper seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. Again, another woe. He says, woe unto you, because they think they got the right thing, but obviously not. They love the upper seats. And by the way, I use that photo, folks, because that's the way the synagogues were. The upper seats, the, the seats up on high, those were the good so seats. Because you were high above all the crowd and people could see who was there. You could really dress up in nice garments and be up high where everybody could see you. So you love the upper seats and greetings in the marketplace. You know, to be called, hi, rabbi, talking to me. Yeah. And that, we like that. He says, but what you're doing is you're being self-centered. That's, well, that's what that is. And then... Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are as graves which appear not, and men, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. <laughs> um, it says, you're, 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 you're graves, and a grave can be smelly. It can be, that's why people put dirt on them. It can be a smelly place. It says, that, and people walk over you and don't know what they you're really dead, and you're smelly. This is, uh, you have a corrupted influence. That's what you have. And the Lord is, and by the way, folks, this is the Lord at this time. He's 33, 32. He's a young man, and he's talking to these people, these religious people, the Pharisees, the scribes, and he's fearless. You got to put yourself there. I mean, to talk down to, I mean, he was, look what he's calling them, hypocrites. Wow. He was, the Lord was fearless, okay? He doesn't want this darkness in us. And by the way, that can be a darkness that can creep in. And because we don't tell people the way it is, because we're afraid, don't let that, not only be self-centered, and have a corrupting influence because you cover. In another place, it says you're whited sepulchers. You look good on the outside, but you're full of dead men, dead men's bones. So this is what he's saying, and he's calling them out. Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, thus, thus saying, thou reproachest us. It says, and look what he's. They say. The lawyers, these are the guys that are experts in the Bible. Are you talking to us? Uh, yeah, I'm talking to you. You guys that know the Bible. Wow. And, he, and they said, you're offending us. You reproach us also. You're rebuking us. And look what he says. 
And he said, Woe unto you, you lawyers, for you laid men with burdens, grievous to be born, and you yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Yeah, that's what they were doing. And it's so easy when you start telling people this is what you got to do. Um, like years ago when I was teaching the little people, I was the children's pastor over at the other church. I, I told them one time, I was talking to a bunch of boys, little boys, and they, I says, you know, once the Spirit of God comes in you, you can never, God's going to be in you forever. You'll go to heaven. And they start asking, what if I sin again? I says, it don't matter. You're going to heaven. And he says, what if I rob a bank? I says, you can probably spend the rest of your life in prison, but you're still going to heaven when you get out of there, when you die. I says, and I says, in fact, you could even shoot somebody dead while you're robbing a bank and still go to heaven. And they go, wow. I says, isn't that great? Isn't that fantastic? And so... Because that's what the Bible teaches. Once the Bible comes, once the Word of God, the Spirit of God comes in you, He'll never leave you. But do you want to spend the rest of your life in, in a penitentiary where you can't go to um, Dairy Queen on, whenever you want to? I says, no. So right after church, a mother came straight at me. I mean, she was walking straight towards me. And uh, she says, can I have a word with you? I says, yes, ma'am. Did you tell my boy he could shoot somebody dead, rob a bank, and still go to heaven? I says, yes, I did. She says, why would you do that? I says, because it's the truth. Did he tell you the other part? She says, what other part? I says, that he spent, he could spend, likely spend the rest of his life in the penitentiary. She says, no. I says, well, yeah, I told him that part too. But see, that's the truth. God wants us to know that. I mean, when you have that kind of knowledge in you, you sleep like a baby. I mean, nothing can take it away from you. Nothing. Nothing. Um, you laid men with burdens, grievous to be born. And you yourselves, and that's what they were doing. The lawyers were doing that, making it difficult. In fact, when the Lord came, you could not spit on the ground and you spit landing on dirt. If you spit... It had to land on a rock, and you were okay. But if your spit landed on the ground, you could be accused of making clay and therefore working on the Sabbath day. See how complicated it had gotten? And the Lord did it on purpose. There's going to be a time when the Lord does this, and then he goes down and he does this. Literally making clay, and it was the Sabbath. What is he doing? And then he raised the dirt and he put it on the man's eyes. He wanted them to see him making dirt, I mean clay. That's what, that's what he was doing. He's doing it on purpose because they were so messed up. And the Lord says they were insincere. And this is the kind of thing. Look what it says. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders but they themselves will not move them with one of their little fingers. You know? They're, they're not for us. They're for you. And they were being insincere. Now look at this, folks. This is an amazing thing. I take you to the book of Esther. 9.13. Look what it says here. Then said Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan, to do tomorrow also according unto this day's decree and let them and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And when you see this, because the king came to the queen and says, Queen, we killed the boys. We killed them. And so what do you want to do with them? And she says, hang them high. And I think this is where the Clint Eastwood movie came from. Hang them high. I said, what? They're already dead. Why would you hang dead people? Why would you hang dead ten boys? Why would you hang them up? They're dead. There's no good reason for it, is there? Yes, there is. Folks, because this is what the Lord wants. You know, I designed billboards for a long time. 
for a company in Houston and then for a company here in San Antonio. These billboards are six, 20 by 60. They're big. They're up about 60 to 80 feet up in the sky. And you can see them you know, pretty far away. You, they're designed so that you can read them uh, while you're doing 60 or 70 miles an hour. And this is a, the, best, the best billboards are short, concise. And they say, Coke is it. The real thing. And then they show you a, a Coke can. They're the best. Because you're doing 70 miles an hour. You don't have a whole lot of time to read a book. You just go, Nyew. you read it. They're the best. Because some people would come to me and they says, I want a girl in a swimsuit. I want a car. I want a map. I want a jingle. And I want a telephone number. And I want my address. I says, too much information. They said, what? I, that's what? I'm paying you to put that on there. I says, there's too much information. I says, you got to get rid of some of that stuff. He says, what do you mean? I says, get rid of the girl. What? Get rid of the girl. Get rid of the car. Get, uh, just your name and maybe the phone number, I says, but your name and the address. And you sell cars. That's it. They didn't like it. They said, no. And sometimes they would come back at me after I gave them all that. I said, okay, you're the client. Whatever you want. We put it up there. And then they says, it doesn't read. I says, Duh. It doesn't read, right? So what the Lord is saying here with a billboard, hang them up high, the Lord wants us, because who are these? These, well, you know, look at it says, 50 cubits, that's how high this thing was. That's 75 feet up in the sky. That's high up there. These boys were going to be hung up there. Who are they? These are the 10 sons of Haman. Who is Haman? That's the flesh. The ten sons or the self-centeredness of us. That's what brings sin into our life. The shadows, the, the obscurity, the, the oscuridad. Es lo que entra al cuerpo. And God says, hang it up high. Put it up there where everybody can see it. So when you stop smoking or drinking, God says, tell the, tell the congregation. I used to smoke. I used to drink. That's, you're showing off. I'll, you know. The things that you're struggling with, hang them up high. If you're doing a testimony, you're giving a testimony because the queen is the light that has come into the palace. The palace is the body and the king is the soul. I'm telling you, folks, the Bible is heavy. It's got a lot of good stuff in it. And it, it tells you so much. And this is what I believe the Lord is telling us here. Now, we're going to have to close. I don't want that darkness to creep in into you where you start thinking, I'm holier than thou, and I've never done none of those things. That's a darkness that can creep. It crept into them, and it, the light, they lost the light. And therefore, when you have somebody like that that's very holy, it's a poor witness. Because who can compare to that? And people say, I don't want to be around that person. They want to be around a person that can say, look, I used to be just like that. But look, there's hope. That's what you want to do. Woe unto you, for you built the sepulchres of the prophets, and you and your fathers killed them. We're gonna, this is a whole other thought, so we're going to have to stop there, folks. We're going to leave it there. And so let us pray. Lord God, maker of heaven and earth, maker of all things that are seen and unseen, to you belongs all praise. Help us, Lord, to be, full, to be filled with light, that when others see us, they don't see any of this um, darkness in us, Lord. That they don't see these things that that hide the light. That they would be uh, attracted to us and thus be attracted to you, Lord. Because it is your light inside us that is the hope of the world. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. For beside you there is another God, and we love you, sir. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good, good. And we'll stop there.